Okay, here we go. Chapter 26, verses 1 to 21, you have a heading there entitled, Judah's Song of Praise and Prayer. We say that it's praise and prayer because there are elements of a lament going through here as well as prayer and praise. So, uh, And it's introduced by Isaiah in that he prophesies or predicts that in that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah. And then he proceeds to recite the song in poetic form here. Verses 1 to 4, the righteous, their salvation. Chapter 26, verses 1 to 4, the righteous, their salvation. O Lord, thou art my... G I'm sorry. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. What is a bulwark anyway? Well, walls and bulwarks. I think the bulwarks are the uh, supports for the wall. Uh, the ramparts, I think, are the ramps that you can use to get up on the wall. I'm not sure, but I think that that's what it is. But the, uh, it sounds to me like the bulwarks are the supports. Um, anyone else know more specifically about that? Is that correct? Um, but in this case, the walls and the bulwarks, I think, are a figure of speech that represent the whole city. And so he's saying salvation is the city, <laughs> okay? Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Well, does someone in these four verses see um, possibly what would be referred to as an inclusio, where the passage begins with a word or a thought and ends with a word or a thought or concept? Strength. Strength, exactly. We have a strong city, and it ends in verse 4 with everlasting strength. So that's the... That's the... the one of the main planks of the passage, if I can put it that way. Verse 5 to 6, we have the wicked brought down. Verses 1 to 4, the righteous, their salvation. Verse 5 to 6, the wicked are brought down. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high, the lofty city, he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. Um, the foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. Look at how things are inverted here from the way the world does it. The world treads on the poor and steps on the needy. Here, the Lord will have the foot of the poor treading on the haughty and the proud and the exploiter and the needy ones are stepping on the haughty the lofty city notice again pride being a characteristic the word haughty proud arrogance and so there you have again the reason for the judgment Verses 7 to 9, we have the righteous, their way. The righteous, their way. Um, twice the word way is used, verse 7 and 8. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou, most upright, dost weigh the path of the just. Boy, there's a perfect classic chiasm. Do you see that? The way of the just, upright. Upright, path of the just. A, B, B, A. Chiasm. Chiasm. Yeah. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Did I go too far? Versus the righteous, their way, seven to nine. Yeah, that's right. With yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Again, the way of the Lord, righteousness, justice. So, <clears throat> the righteous, their way, verses 7 to 9. Verse 10 and 11, again, we take up the wicked. The wicked are devoured, verse 10 and 11. Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see and be ashamed. For their envy at the people, yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Some interesting concepts here. <coughs> the fire of thine enemies shall devour them? Whose enemies? God's enemies are going to devour the wicked. God will use his own enemies to destroy the wicked. Um, you could speculate for hours on that, how that might be, happen. Then we have the righteous again in verse 12 to 13. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also has wrought all our works in us. O Lord our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. So we have the righteous, their God, verse 12 to 13. Verse 14, we have the wicked, no resurrection. The wicked, no resurrection. At least not the first resurrection. Well, uh, that distinction is not made in this passage. <laughs> picky, picky. Um, verse 14, they are dead and they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. No rising. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them, and made all their memory perish. Could that rise be rise and uh, glory with the Lord and his reign? Well, certainly that's true, that they will not reign with the Lord in glory. And as far as uh, building a doctrine on the resurrection is concerned, you never take an isolated passage and try to conclude a doctrine on the resurrection from one single passage. You have to accumulate what the entire scriptures say, and so you have to recognize that there is also a progressiveness, a progression of revelation going on here. Whether Isaiah was mindful, death, yeah, but whether Isaiah was mindful of uh, the, the the distinctions that are made in the New Testament about the first and the second resurrection, or the resurrection unto life and the resurrection unto judgment, I don't know. Um, certainly, the thought here is that they will not rise to trouble you again. Um, they will not rise to reign with the Lord in glory. And, and I don't believe that resurrection is really... Um, because the second resurrection is unto death, it's not truly a resurrection. You know, it's not a resurrection unto life. You know what I mean? So, um, 
we're not going to draw any conclusions based on just this one verse uh, for the doctrine of the resurrection. You have to take all of Scripture's teaching on that. But certainly he's made their memory to perish, and uh, that's something that uh, everyone who has no hope beyond the grave wants, is for their life to have meant something, uh, for a reputation to linger, for uh, a memorial to live on, you know, uh, in their name. But here, the Lord is saying that their memory, too, will perish, the enemies of God. Um, then verses 15 to 20, we have the righteous nation increased and preserved. Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far unto all the ends of the earth. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Like as a woman with child that draws near the time of her delivery is in pain and cries out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. Hmm. Interesting. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they rise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So contrast verse 14 and 19. They are dead, they shall not live. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. In other words, they, in verse 14, they are deceased, they shall not rise. Together with my dead body shall they arise. So uh, the contrast is really, really obvious. I'm looking at a note here. Uh, it says that body is in the plural. Thy dead shall live. My dead bodies shall they arise, or shall arise. In other words, the dead bodies of Jehovah's people shall arise. So, uh, we see no switch. How so? We see no switch in person. Like, the, the 16, the Lord... Mm-hmm. So why would it switch all of a sudden? Switching to thy dead shall live? Along with my dead body. Why, why would Isaiah say, Lord, thy dead men shall live together with my dead bodies? My it's dead body. plural in Hebrew, they say. Right, but, but you know what I'm trying to say? In the same sentence, you yes. can't have two people speak. Right. Unless, um, hmm. that is a little weird. But it wouldn't be impossible for Isaiah to regard uh, Jehovah's people as his people as well. To say, my, my dead people shall arise. In, and in the same sentence, it would still be legitimate to say, thy, thy dead shall live my dead body shall arise. Reincarnation. Yeah. They have more than one body. Reincarnation, James says. <coughs> is there a key as the verses? Uh, explain. Oh, like 14 and 19, 15 and 18, 16 and 17. We've been with child, 15 now to increase the nations of the Lord. 16 and 17, they visited thee. 
put on a prayer in the chastening? Well, perhaps in concept, but not with words. Yeah, not with words, but concept. Verse 15, you've increased the nations, and in verse 18 you have uh, the nation being with child. But <laughs> we have brought forth wind. Is, is, is Isaiah saying, we've been with child, we've been in pain, but all we've produced is wind? <laughs> No, I mean, it's, it's humorous, but it's, I'm just, it's a serious question. Yeah. And uh, we've produced nothing. We have nothing to our credit. Show that, show that wife, worst your wife, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, King Jimmy sure had a humor. I guess it didn't realize that we would be so... Uh, yes. I can hear uh, Queen Elizabeth saying, I am amused. I'm not amused. Chapter 26, let's see what uh, the never, never version says here. <coughs> what verse is that? 26, verse 18. In the NIV, chapter 26, verse 18, it says, We were with child, we writhed in pain, but we gave birth to wind. We have not brought salvation to the earth. We have not given birth to people of the world. Huh. But your dead will live. Their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Man, every time I do this, I, I wished I knew my Hebrew. Because sometimes there is such a disparity between two translations, you know? It's so different. All right. And then in verse 21, we have, verse 15 to 20, we have the righteous nation increased and preserved. And you might say in spite of themselves, because there's almost a self-imprecation there, um, or self-condemnation. Isaiah is saying, we haven't brought salvation to anyone. Uh, we've been in pain. We, we've been in pain as a woman in child labor, but haven't brought forth. We haven't produced. Yet our bodies will rise. I wonder if there's an indication there of grace. So then, in verse 21, the final is the wicked are destroyed. The wicked are destroyed. Twenty. Well, verse 20 is included in the righteous nation. I didn't read that. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. Shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. Or passed over, I wonder. Hide yourself a little until his wrath has passed by. What do you suppose that could be a reference to? Well, if this is the people of Israel, yeah. well, if this is the tribulation, yeah. hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath is passed by. Then in verse 21, For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. There we have the wicked destroyed. Uh, just an observation to him in this whole chapter, we see the wicked, the wicked are brought down, then they're devoured, and then they're destroyed. Mm -hmm. the progressive boom. Yeah. Well, brought down, devoured, not raised, the, the Noah's resurrection, and then destroyed. Yeah. And I wonder if there's a progression for the righteous, too. Salvation, their way, their God, increased and preserved. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it brings a lot of results when you stop and ponder, you know. You uh, break up a chapter, look at the various units, give the units one key word as a summary heading, and then see if there's a relationship there. And you might just discover that you're onto something. You might just discover 
you might have just discovered the very intent of the author. All right, now for chapter 7, 27, in our remaining time, I'm going to ask you to go afar abroad and collect all the commentaries and dictionaries and all the helps that you can get because we're going to work on chapter 27 together this morning before noon. Can I come in? None of us too long. We're doing chapter 27 together in class and uh, we're going to read the text first. Uh, going around the circle here, three verses each. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. In that day sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Bob? Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let, them, or let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me. And he shall make peace with me. He shall cause them that come up Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Happy smitten him as he smote those that smote him, or is he slain according to the slaughter of them that, slain, that are slain by him? In measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayeth his rock wind in that day of the east wind. By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. All this is all the fruit to take away his sin. When he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones, that are beaten under sender, the groves and the images shall not stand up. Yet the fenced city shall be desolate, and the habitation forsaken, and left like a wilderness, and there shall it cast be, and there shall he lie down, and consume the branches thereof. When the boughs thereof are withered, they shall be broken off, and the women come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore he that made them will have not mercy on them, and he that formed them will show them no favor. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, shall in that day that the Lord shall be off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and he shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in the day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come, and shall ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcast in the land of Egypt, and shall wash them all in the whole mountain of Israel. Okay, thank you. First thing we need to do is ask our questions. Terminology. Terminology type questions, vocabulary type questions, okay? So fire away. What are some questions you have starting with verse verse one? My question was the fact that it should be in the previous chapter, no? Pardon me? I think it should be in the previous chapter. Chapter twenty seven should be included in the previous chapter? Verse verse one. Scared of flies, are we? Uh huh. Uh, why do you say that? Um, because the Lord's punishing the wicked, and uh, I believe Leviathan is a is a picture of Satan or the term the crooked serpent, and that it would go with the judgment to pass on the wicked in verse twenty one. And I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but just at first glance, it doesn't seem like this really fits in this chapter in this single verse here. Mm-hmm. Now it could, because I noticed that at least four four times other than this, the three. In that day is mentioned. So we see in that day in the verse in the first verse of this chapter. So maybe that's the key. I found in that day in verse one, verse two, verse twelve, and thirteen. Did you notice that? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. Um verse twelve and thirteen also have it shall come to pass. Okay, so when you see that just jot it down under your notes section. Okay, what I often, what, the way I outline, I, I try to get the outline, and then I reserve a section called notes, explanatory notes, and uh, that's where I put down the comments that are necessary to explain um, either uh, things that I need to be reminded of. Is the repetition in this chapter? Is there a structure that I can see? I see the first two verses in 
last two verses except in that day? Uh, in that day, verses 1 and 2, and verses uh, 12 and 13? Yeah. Okay. It shall come to pass in that day in verses 12 and 13. Mm -hmm. um, so, does anyone agree with you? Or disagree? Or what's the discussion on Leviathan? Well, as far as Leviathan is concerned, I've noticed that there are three different terms for Leviathan here Leviathan, the piercing serpent, Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and the dragon that is in the sea. I think that they're all synonyms. But do you think that this could be the unholy trinity? A reference to the unholy trinity? The devil's given all kinds of names. Serpent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, that I, answer his question, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on it. I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. But again, you know, it is interesting whenever a threesome shows up in, in a description of, uh, of the devil, if this Leviathan is a description of the devil. I would say it's safe. To um, to identify him as such. I, I think you'd find that if we went to uh, cross references. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want do you want any comments on that specific thing yet, or do you want to save those for after? Well, let's let's just rack up the questions first. So, okay. who is Le Leviathan? Was a question. Verse two: In that day, sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. What kind of song is that? <laughs> That's the question I have. What kind of song is that? Well, I think that we could probably... We've seen enough of the vineyard in Isaiah to identify it as Israel, don't you think? Does that mean that that's here? Will we jump to that conclusion? Um, let's see if there's anything else in the passage that relates to the vineyard. Um... Verse 4, it says, Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. Or let them take hold of my strength. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. He shall cause them that come up of, come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. In verse 8, In measure when it shooteth forth. The word shoot is is the term that is used of a, a new branch budding out. So there again, an agricultural term. Do you know why I said it's Israel? Just in the context, it says in the vineyard of red wine, next I, the Lord, do keep it. Yeah. Do you know why I said it's Israel? Yeah. Because it's in the context of Israel. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No? Well, no, right up. I mean, you've got the one I would have asked. Which was what? Le Le Leviathan. Leviathan? Okay. Um, what about um, verse 4, Amanda? It says, Their fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? What do you suppose is meant by briars and thorns? Do you understand that? I'm asking Amanda. <laughs> Do you understand what that means? No. Okay, then why don't you ask the question, what does briars and thorns mean? That's that's a question that would occur to you. you without understanding what that means, you can't understand the verse, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by having a, a, a natural inquisitive mind about working your way through a chapter. You have to ask yourself questions. Okay. You have to provoke yourself to think through this. And it's hard work, but you have to do it. So, uh, <clears throat> what do briars and thorns mean? That that uh, that phrase comes up again and again. Okay. Um, verse five. Let the, let him take hold of my strength. Well, him. Is a pronoun, right? Let him take hold of my strength. Who's it talking about? Probably the virus part. Which is? That he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me? Lord. Huh? Lord. The Lord? Peace with the Lord. Yes. Yeah, but he's offering, is he, is he not offering to make peace? If they will just he's offering to make peace with someone. Verse 6, He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud, and fill the face of the world with fruit. Now we've seen that before, haven't we? Do you remember how the branch, the root of Jesse, and the fruit of the land, or the, 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 the branch, the servant of the Lord, the fruit of the land filled the whole earth. That was in Isaiah 7, wasn't it? Um, here we have the fruit of Israel blossoming and budding and filling the face of the world with fruit. You know, a question that occurs to me is a theological one. Well, not in theological, but... Here in verse 6, it says that Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit, and yet we just read that uh, they were as a woman with child and brought forth nothing but wind in the previous chapter. Remember that? So do we have the human aspect and the divine aspect? The, okay, I, I check the 19 in salvation verse. The, the, we cannot conclude, but some... some some book in this salvation verse, the Jesus Christ the resurrection, mm -hmm. through his resurrection you say. Some book insisted that it is? Yeah. But my, my point is my suggestion is even though Jesus Christ war with Israel's, but they reject it. So if they accept it, then something story is different, but they reject it. So Jesus Christ his dying death alone and he resurrected alone and he gave the salvation. And to us, the uh, point is, verse one twenty seven. Verse one is, he punished the Leviathan. Levi Leviathan is a symbol of the like a dragon, mm -hmm. the the spiritual evil one, mm -hmm. the fundamental enemy. Not only Israel, but also whole the humankind. Right. So when he killed that, then this is the son and briar. Sons and briar is like the. The sin result to curse, curse is is away, get away. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it is like uh, after we save the person, the blessing. Not only Israel, but also the spiritual Israel. Okay, can I stop you for a minute? We're, we've we're still asking questions, and then what I want to do is assign you these questions and say now go find the answers. You're giving us all the answers. I don't want the answers just okay. yet. Okay. Um. <clears throat> So, 
let's continue going through and asking the questions. Um, but that was a question that occurred to me. How do you reconcile the fact that here... Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit, whereas in the previous chapter, Israel brought forth nothing but wind. Well, fruit, uh, okay. maybe it's uh, physical food. All right. Um, keep that in mind and, and research that question. We get oranges from that. Hmm? We get oranges from that. Yeah. Working on down through the chapter, what other questions occur to you? Verse 8, In measure when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Read that some Sunday morning and sit down without explanation and say, May the Lord bless this word to your hearts. Uh, NIV. Let's see if they make it any easier. Verse 8, 27. Verse 8. By warfare and exile, you contend with her. With his fierce blast, he drives her out as on a day the east wind blows. There's a footnote here that says the meaning of the Hebrew word for this word is uncertain. King James says, in measure when it shooteth forth. And NIV says, drives her out. Wow. You need to... Uh, some of these verses need a total exegesis. You know, you need to do word studies to find out what's going on here in the text. Like I said, this is a difficult chapter. It's a difficult one for me. I tried to study it, but this is a 12 o'clock midnight, and my mind just started swimming. Uh, By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sin, when he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in thunder, the groves and images shall not stand up. Obviously a reference to the uh, um, idol worship. The altars of idol worship will be ground up like chalk, chalk stones, pounded into dust. Um... The defensed city shall be desolate and the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. What city is that? Verse 10. There shall the calf feed, left like a wilderness, there shall the calf feed and there shall he lie down and consume the branches thereof. The branches? What's left over? After a tree is felled. In verse 11, when the boughs thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The women come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore he that made them will not have mercy on them, and he that formed them will show them no favor. Obviously we need to know what the defensed city means. Verse 10. Is that Jerusalem? If it's Jerusalem, look at what's happening here. Look at the movement in the chapter. In verse 6, he shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Verse 10, yet the defense city shall be desolate and the habitation is forsaken. Their boughs are going to be withered and broken off and the women come and are going to burn them. People have no understanding. It would be very unusual if in the same passage they're blessed and cursed. Not really. No? If it's a time progression. Uh, God established them in the land, okay, that second time after the mm -hmm. dispersion. Yep. Then he disperses them again and <coughs> judges them. Because it talks about, it says in 9, Therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin, when he maketh all the stones of the altars chalked up, the stones that are beaten and stubborn. Uh -huh. So I believe he's talking about judgment on Jacob. You know, later on in the chapter. Maybe, maybe it's a time progression. Like, like a series of events, not just one thing. It's possible that he's got this um, typical prophetic vision that sees double, you know. Yeah. He's seeing judgment and blessing at the same time, but it's not happening at the same time. Right. It's 
stereoscopic or stereo prophetic vision. Let's call it that. <laughs> stereo prophetic vision. Do we talk? Do we, talk do we now talk about the eleven? talks about the regathering in twelve. Yeah. Come to pa it'll, it'll come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt. And you shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts outcast in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Okay, we have 20 minutes left. What I'd like you to do now is... Uh, pursue some of these questions. I'm going to ask Bob to uh, do some work on In That Day. Uh, I'm going to ask Amanda to do work on the word Leviathan. As much as you can find out about Leviathan. Okay. Um, briars and Thorns. Chang, would you do work on the term briars and thorns? What does no, that mean? No. Yeah. And I'm going to let you work at it for 10 minutes. I write out a paragraph, and I'll be coming back, and we'll ask for your explanations. Um, the phrase, let him take hold of my strength. Who is that? Verse 7. Jason? Um, Who's, no, I'm just, I want you to work on it. Don't just give me an answer right now. Um, and James, I want you to work on the conundrum of who the defense city is and who the Lord is judging after he pronounces blessing on Israel. What's the, what's the, the passage? Verse 5, it says, Or let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me. You said verse 7 of it, right? Okay, I'm sorry. Let him, who is that him? The pronoun him, what does that represent? I'll be back in 10 minutes. Okay. 10 minutes have transpired, and we're going to be answering some of the questions that we posed that uh, occurred to us as we read chapter 27. So first of all, in that day, the phrase in that day, could we have some answers there, please? In that day, the day of God's vengeance and all his other enemies have been put down, Jehovah shall finally visit with the sword. The three mighty foes which are described in the three figures. In that day, we have a general picture of the events which precede the condition of the uh, inauguration of a new era. Of a new era. Okay. All right, thank you. So in that day, uh, but often we see events described that were that are already fulfilled as having been in that day as well so is it possible that in that day include all events leading up to final judgment not all events but i mean all judgment events, judgment events. you know new era just in two, two different empires. in in the way that um the Apostle Peter said in Acts chapter 2, he refers back to Joel 2.20, but Joel 2.20 is a reference of the last days, in that, in the, in that day, or in those days. Okay. So the Revelation, they said, one beast is coming from the sea, coming off from the oh, sea. We're not talking about the beast yet. We're yes. still talking about in that day. Yes. Okay, so who had the question of the Leviathan? I did. Okay, we'll talk about that next then. What did you find? Um, well, they they have for Isaiah twenty seven one that Leviathan is a serpent, um, but they they it has been uh, used for a crocodile or a sea monster or even a whale in different um, books. Uh huh. And it says um, Isaiah uses the destroy Leviathan to symbolize a triumphant judgment day when God will triumph over the threatening evil of the world system. Okay. The threatening evil of the world system, and we know who rules the world system, right? So, we're not far off when we say that Leviathan here is this symbolic of Satan. Uh, I don't believe that uh, 
and that would be an incorrect interpretation at all. <coughs> all right, who had the term vineyard? Israel? Whether it's Israel or not? Or did we give that one out? No, we didn't. Briars and thorns. Chang. Briar and thorns. It's different word. Briars and thorns. From verse uh, 4. Briar is uh, several reference, but simply saying it is used for 